So this, this uh, one hour lecture is about urban data science, uh, but I thought the first thing I should do is to um, give you uh, what we call an elevator pitch. I don't know if you have heard what an elevator pitch is, but it's essentially um, if you meet someone in a, in a lift, you need to be able to tell them in one minute what you are about. And this is my elevator pitch for those who have uh, not met me yet. So um, I'm interested in harvesting accurate geographical and behavioral data efficiently. So we look at how we put, um, we, we attach sensors and uh, devices to humans and also animals to gather this data and uh, model and analyze the data that comes out of it that often has a temporal and spatial granularity which is very high and then feed back what we learn into applications. And uh, one of the applications in my research has been urban, uh, but there have been also um, health and service improvement applications. And uh, I'm not talking about them here, but if you want to go to my webpage, you'll find um, some more examples. So today, it's all about urban data science. Um, and um, I, I put there a link of, um, of a workshop we had um, in December last year, and uh, we invited a number of speakers in the in the in the area of urban data science. I'm not talking about their research. I will um, talk about uh, our stance at urban data science. So I refer you to that for a more broader view of uh, data science, and I'll refer to other papers as well uh, while I talk. Um, notice that um, urban data science um, has been fed by a number of recently available data sets that um, start being everywhere and they empower us to do um, and to study our processes of using cities and of living the cities and uh, of, of living them better in, in a way. Um, the data we use has all sorts of biases. I'm not talking about the biases. I'll refer to some of them um, when, when I refer to some of the data. Uh, but, but oh, even studying the biases is an interesting aspect of urban data science. So um, without further ado, here's, it, here's what I plan to talk about. In fact, a subset of these things I plan to talk about. Um, and it's, it's all based on... So hopefully by then, you, if you really want to get into urban data science, you will have um, a good view of, um, of, of the area. So um, the first aspect, which in fact I left last because I might not be able to cover it in this hour, is about urban mobility and how mob mobility data can help us understanding the, 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 the trends in cities and how people use resources and, and move around um, and how you can build models to then to predict their mobility. Then, of course, um, we are interested in um, economic development and development of, of our <coughs> cities and our uh, urban landscape. And we had uh, a few works um, related to urban growth and how, for example, you decide where to place a shop, a venue. Um, you want to decide which is the best place for your venue. And um, that, that's one thing that you can use data um, multiple levels of data to, to decide that. Uh, so, so I'll go more in detail on that. That's the first thing we're doing. And um, recently, and this is more something that um, is not yet finalized, I give you, I give you the path we're in and, and uh, our thoughts here, is how um, we can look at policies and governmental decisions and look if in the data we can see aspects of how the policies <coughs> have impacted the space and impacted the life of people and if there is a correlation or even even better if we can see changes and if you if we can see how, how, how things um, have changed we looked because of the data we had in a way you have to do what you can uh, we looked at um, the regeneration due to the olympics investment and um, we looked at correlations between neighborhoods and mobility and IMD scores, which is uh, index of multiple deprivation um, that the government uh, pushes out every five years. Or so. Then um, one, one thing that is um, more related to my mobility, mobile system background, is how to then push services onto the user's devices to uh, provide them with information. 
Uh, what, one important uh, thing that we thought was missing in this urban world was information, uh, real-time information about taxis availability and, um, and brokerage of services. Um, I'll, I'll show you that there are uh, various services where um, taxis applications provide uh, different prices depending on the time of the day and sometimes you need to dynamically decide which is the best best solution for your transport. And th that's one thing that using data available, we will be able to put in an application in the pockets of the users uh, to help them. So this is, if you then want to switch off um, and, and, and not listen to me anymore, um, you know, I've given you <laughs> sort of hints. Now you can, you can go into the slides and look at the references for the papers for each of the parts and then you're done here. So you could even exit <laughs> or switch off on the YouTube channel, switch off now. <laughs> so. Um, we have worked a lot with this sort of data. This is Foursquare data. It's like Facebook, but you tell your friends uh, where you are. So you can tell your friends where you're checking in. And this is data from Tokyo, different colors, different type of venues um, indicated there, different times of the day. You can really see the activity of a city uh, very, very well. And uh, the intensity and then again, transport people draining out of the city and going back um, to uh, perhaps where they are or anyway sleeping and there are only a few points that um, are there anymore. Another visualization, if I may manage to make it start, yeah, is uh, Manhattan. So the, the circles are how many people are checking in in that particular location. The colors are the different types of locations. I can give you a bit of context of what they are. Greens is parks, um, yellow is food, um, then there is... Uh, universities are black, red was art, um, uh, the blue there is transport. Um, so yeah, you, you can see um, that the data kind of makes sense. Okay, so this, this is like um, grounding base. The data, data kind of makes sense, has lots of biases, but somehow you're able to build a spatial network out of this data and consider the mobility um, from one place to the next. This is where I want you all on the same page here on this. Okay, so from this data you can build graphs, spatial graphs. Now, um, the, first, the first paper, um, first piece of work I want to discuss with you, and really it's not about the findings, it's about the methodology here, um, is one that uh, we published a few years ago, and there is an article also on my web page, um, New Scientists Covered It. It's about um, th this aspect of uh, where can I place a shop if I decide that I want to open a new shop. I have a few options, a few uh, perhaps a few <coughs> locations have opened up, I can afford them, which one is best for my shop. And of course we're not the first one to, um, to consider these problems. Uh, land economy literature offers a lot of um, more static and more historical data based solutions for this. Um, and, um, and we looked at how perhaps the, r not real-time mobility, but the, the quite uh, fine-grained level of mobility data that we have can augment that information to provide a better solution. So um, one very, if, if you're interested in this problem, I suggest you try and read this paper, which is not ours, it's for by Pablo Jensen. And it's about using network so complex network metrics to um, understand, so understand this problem um, a bit better. So they define something that we then uh, go and use in our data. Um, that's the first thing we tried. And, and that's the kind of um, collocation coefficient. How many times has a Starbucks been close to a station? How many times do we find a Starbucks close, close enough, let's say, to a station? Uh, with respect to perhaps a network where we place all these locations randomly somehow. Um, so th there is a definition, I'm not going through formulas, I don't have the time for that, but it's based on, on network properties and statically looking at the data and see how many, how frequently is it that um, this particular type of location is close to a, st a station or, I don't know, a school. And, and these are numbers uh, that go from, if it's one, it's like, uh, if it was a random model, but the more, the higher the number, um, the less random this is. We tried, in this data in particular, we tried with different type of chains, how often are Starbucks close to a train, uh, train station. So this is something that, although 
quite novel already, was already in the literature. But it, it's a very interesting uh, approach somehow to then uh, consider what is best and um, how successful um, that can be. But we thought, given the data we had, we could go one step further and not just consider the <coughs> static network, considering where these things are placed geographically and how close they are, but considering the traffic, people that enter Starbucks, where do they come from? Do they come from the station? Do they come from the school? So who's contributing to my, um, my, my, my <coughs> popularity in a way? And we, we constructed a measure that considered the transitions probabilities of, of, of this to, to allow this to be considered. So if you, um, how, what are the contributors in a way to this particular locations uh, with respect to perhaps general um, transition probabilities in, in a world that doesn't consider this particular venues. And even here, um, we came up with, um, with a measure that um, has um, some numbers for different um, for different chains, we tried these different chains, so hostel, free market, sculpture, they look like, um, they're, they're kind of different from the previous one, but actually quite similar if you, if you look more carefully, so train station is again up here. Um, so there is a correlation between the two, but it's, it's, it's a different matrix in a way. So um, then of course, um, the, the other first thing we tried um, after that was to consider this prediction problem and see, well, how well can we do with this data set? How well can we use the data we have, both statically, and so the geographic data, but also the dynamic mobility data, to do this um, prediction, economically in a way, popularity prediction. So considering various areas, imagine we consider areas um, of a certain radius, we have a bunch of them in the cities, let's say there are um, possibilities of shops um, that we can open, and uh, we want to um, rank all these locations so that the first in the rank is the one that will lead to most popularity. In this particular uh, paper, of course, the data we had was uh, static. So what we did was to use um, leave one out um, approaches by which we train the data on the rest of the city and predict for a number of locations. But, um, just to see if the approach was meaningful. What are the features that we consider? So what are the aspects that we think are meaningful in this sort of, um, in this sort of approach? The geographical, so the fixed ones, um, are clearly density. How many places are around the area uh, where I want to put the shop? So considering, let, let's consider we have a bunch of possible locations. Let's consider the density around these locations to decide. Area entropy, how many venues do we have? Um, uh, how heterogeneous is that selection of venues? Competitiveness, how many other Starbucks are there in there? Because um, uh, we, we, we'll look into competitiveness uh, more a bit later. And then this, uh, this Jensen coefficient, the one that I mentioned um, at the start, which is uh, the one that says how, how is the train station contributing to the Starbucks um, ev around here? So we, we looked at what, what proportion of the categories that are mostly contributing to this type of categories are around this area? So are there train stations in this area? Because it looks like for, for Starbucks, that's the best thing to have around. So. And then the mobility features. Um, popularity. How many check-ins does the area have? If you think about it, it's equivalent. It's, it's, a, it's a dynamic way of seeing density. Density says how many shops do I have, but what if these shops are many, but they don't bring so many people in? Uh, popularity is a dynamic view of it. Transition density, how many, how many people come from outside this area to then use the area? Sorry, that's, that, that's a, sorry, I was reading here, the incoming flow. The transition density is how, how connected the area is, how many transitions there are inside the area. And then this is transition quality, which is, um, again, the, in, if you remember in the second slides, I said that we transformed the Jensen coefficient in something dynamic that um, was counting how, who are the contributors um, for this venue. So in Starbucks, we know train stations 
will probably lead to a number of venues, but we had hostels as well. So who are the contributors to the check-ins that we have? Where do you check in before? And how many of these contributors are in fact in this area? So by using this sort of dynamic and uh, more geographical si fixed metrics, we, we, we constructed a, and here is about the methodology in which we, we kind of looked at this problem, right? So in practice, in our data, we have a ranking of, okay, well, look, it looks like Starbucks was best placed up here near, I don't know, Grand Central. Um, and we have a ranking of possibly 10 locations in the ground truth of the data. We are trying to compare our predicted ranking to that. And for that, we use a metric that, um, how many of you know the normalized discounted cumulative gain, so that I know? So that's a metric that was built in information retrieval and is used to compare ranking. There, there are many of them, we use one. Um, it's used to compare rankings. And uh, what, it, what it says, it, 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 it um, essentially compares the ground truth ranking to um, where the items, the 10 items of this ground truth ranking are ranked in your prediction. And it's a metric that calculates how well you do. And it goes up to one. Um, if, if you do really, really well, so the ranking is the same, it goes up to one. So we looked at the, the value of this for individual features and also in a supervised learning approach where we use the features together um, to come up with how well how prediction can do. And um, if you look at that somehow, just by using static geographical feature, we do quite well. But then when you add all the mobility features, you manage to go up again for all the, the chains. The single features I know have different performance um, for, for the different chains. And um, we've tried with, with other data as well to see what, th there's lots of variability there, but, but there's definitely an avenue uh, we, we are, we're looking into. And uh, that's definitely something that um, seems to be very promising. Um, I want to go into, uh, now if you have questions, please ask. I might have to repeat them, but okay. Yeah? I have one question. Uh, how do you, uh, if, if it's to do with, I have some example of the fact that lots of Starbucks are near the stations, mm -hmm. it leads you to predicting that Starbucks should be near the stations. Right, yeah, yeah. <coughs> that's, uh, no, we, we, I mean, that, that's exactly how it is. And uh, I guess, the, the prediction task would consider that if there is a Starbucks somewhere else and it's doing really well, it would consider it, but the bias will be there and it's um, unbalanced in a way. Um, we, we, we're not, we, we just use the data for that. But th there is something there, I think, I think you're right. I'm not sure I'm answering. Well, I'm just wondering why the, you know, there, there are many Starbucks within a very small radius of where I live that maybe they accumulate for this reason. Yeah, why, why there are many Starbucks? Uh, yeah, I think uh, the one, as one answer that I can give you, um, perhaps I don't have it here, but we looked at cooperation and competitiveness mm -hmm. of groups of um, stores. And I think there is something there. So from, for some of the stores, I'll, I'll see you in a slide, but maybe I'll go quicker in that slide because I've already explained it. Um, it looks like for some of the chains, it's, it's a well-known problem, but I'm not reinventing anything here. Um, some stores are better clustered, even if they are of the same type, and some are competing instead, so they steal each other's checking. We'll see that in the data, we actually see it. Um, I'm not sure we have the data. I, I think we had the data for Starbucks. I don't think I have the data for Starbucks here, but it'd be interesting to look at that. So the data I showed you um, until now was only, um, only a few months of data. Um, we then went on and used a data set that is uh, three years of data, 100 cities, um, the description uh, of the data is in this in this paper here. <coughs> um, so it's it's a it's a temporal it's a longitudinal data set where we can see things such as London growth. Um, this is the number of places that we have in London and where they are in 2011, and this is the number of places that were created in London um, after that, um, distributed by location. Now. Um, we have looked at where these places were, were placed by distributing the new venues proportionally to the different areas to see, well, if, if an area had already a higher proportion of venues, we expect that rate to come, perhaps to generate more. And um, so these are areas where we had <coughs> less than expected number of places <coughs> generated. And here are, is an area where we have more places than we expected in that time, time frame. 
Now, there was a very, very bright dot here. Um, did you, can, can you imagine what it is, given the time? This is London, should be familiar. Some people are smiling. Olympics. It was the Olympics. Um, this was uh, mainly the Olympic Park area. And I'll, I'll, I'll go a bit into that later. So um, just to go back to the question we had, um, new places. What if I open another burger place near a burger place? What happens to, to the area? Um, so this is the impact of the monthly, average monthly check-ins when a new, stair, a, a new burger opens in the same area. And the red line there is the median. And one, the one uh, horizontal line at one is when nothing happens, no impact. We see no impact. So um, in most cases, this is uh, for all the data. I can't remember if it was just one city. Um, I think it must have been. Um, we see that these are for all the burger joints and um, when another one opened, what was the impact? In this case, there was a positive impact in this case as well, but in the median says that it was under one. I have all the numbers in the next slide. Same for bookstores, you would expect it, right? You have a new bookstore <laughs> around the corner and, and, and you see it in the data, the check-ins go down. Airport gates, so more airports, airport expansion leads to more, more check-ins somehow. So that, that's kind of the opposite. And uh, interestingly, we, we could split the data into groups of cooperative and competing venues. Um, they make sense. Grocery stores top up there and quite, um, quite up also if you consider the median there. Um, if you open another gro grocery store, it's not useful. Um, let me see if I find, uh, I think we had coffee places. I don't remember them. Um, Turkish restaurants, that's interesting. I, um, we then, in, in the paper, we study the, the gensek coefficient of um, Turkey, um, Turkish places, because um, it looks like it's the, you know, it's the cohesive aspect of creating the community and having all the Turkish places together brings people to the Turkish area and, 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 and it works. It seems that in, in this particular case it works. So um, the, the data shows um, th this sort of interesting aspects. Um, that, that are, are interesting to look at. And, and at the longitudinal part of it is that you can experience what change you have in the, in the data. And, and it's interesting to look at. It's interesting to come up with metrics that can uh, experience <coughs> that growth and, and describe it. So um, again, for this data, we looked, we started looking, this is very recent. In fact, um, we went for this data for policy workshop that uh, conference or workshop that we had in, it's, I think it's a conference, that we, we had in Cambridge um, a few months back and considered the regeneration policies of the London Olympics. Um, so we went into government websites and downloaded these policies. So um, transforming the heart of London, making the Olympic part a blueprint of sustainable living, uh, regeneration of the Thames Gateway. So this were the aims. And more generally, strategic regeneration framework, creation, creating a coherent and uh, high quality city within this world city region, improving education, skills, raising aspirations. So what can we see in the data that was the government's aim for this? And we had enough longitudinal data here to see what happened in the region, to, to see if there were any, <coughs> any effects. So uh, as I said, we're only scratching the surface on this one. We, we started seeing a few things, and I'll just report on what we've seen uh, but the, the and, and the methodology we've used. So certainly the number of venues um, for the, so the two lines are, one is the London average, one is the Hosboro average. So how is this increasing? Uh, this is cumulative, and, and you can see that um, definitely the number of venues in the host boroughs has increased and it keeps increasing or kept increasing in the data. That's even more true if you look at the growth rate of the venues, and uh, there you go, here and here you have major peaks for the on the boroughs averages. Interestingly, if you look at the impact per borough, now here this is um, 
you, you, need, you need to look at how the curve grows because there are different starting points. But let's look at the red line here. And uh, <coughs> this is the new home where you have the Olympic Park and you see a big growth here. And then it kind of flattens out. If you look at the dynamic view of this, so not just the venues, but also, also the check-ins, Again, uh, we had lots of people in London during the Olympics. You can see it in the blue line here. And wh one interesting thing that I always like to look at is these dips here and here that are essentially, I think it's Christmas um, <laughs> when everything closes. It's, uh, it's remarkable. Um, and but you see that the, the, the London Olympics are actually very clear in the data that only refers to the boroughs. And here is divided by the different boroughs that you have for, for London. Um, the, this, this line here is the Olympic Park, so most of the check-ins were there. I'm interested in looking at what happens afterwards. So this regeneration policies, how did it work? What, what, what are we doing here? We still have some data, some tales of data. So um, for some of the boroughs, it was flat throughout. For some, they had a peak, and then they went back normal. But if you look at Greenwich here, no, this is Hackney, sorry, Hackney. Uh, the green line growing Hackney seems to have picked up and increased a little bit. Now, one of the things um, in the next couple of slides I'll show you is uh, let's look at how this relates and how if we can do something with data, we, haven't, we, we are doing that at the moment, is uh, to look at IMD, index of multiple deprivation, is something that the government pushes out every five years. There was one in 2010 and one in 2015. This is, on the y-axis, you have the change in the ranking for the various parts of the deprivation index. And um, the, the IMD, the full ranking, is the pink one at, at, the, at the bottom there. Um, for the different neighborhoods, what we see is, in fact, that Hackney was increasing there. We saw a number of check-ins increase, mobility check-ins increase. Most of the, the, the IMD was kind of improving and um, crime wasn't, but <laughs> the rest were okay. Um, Greenwich as well. Um, it looks like, they, we, we haven't checked this, maybe something we can see in the data, but um, affordable living uh, wasn't exactly something that was pushed there and um, I think that that should come out of the data. Um, the neighborhood that weren't so much changing still have um, quite a bad IMD in a way. Um, so so th there is a correlation with the data. We haven't quite done that part yet, but uh, we're meaning to. We've, we've done a little bit, and I'll show you what. So um, until now, I've made you look at this data as a spatial graph, just one graph, um, where you have nodes and you can come up with metrics of, um, of clustering, uh, of um, connectivity, but it's a spatial graph. In reality, the data set also has uh, a user social network component like the one that Facebook has. Um, so you could, in theory, relate the two. And to do that, we've used, um, we've used quite a bit of, uh, of what, what the community calls multi-layer network analytics. Um, in this particular case, the multi-layer only refers to two layers. So you have your users who are connected, they're friends, they have a connection of some sort, but they also check in into places, and the places are connected by, let's say, how many people go from here to here. So it's a double network, and, 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 and you, can, you can project arcs between the two. Um, so this, this, you can say that this user is using the network by visiting this place, this place, and this place. And uh, this place is connecting these two users because um, they're both visiting the place. And they might or might not be connected on, on, on the social network. It doesn't matter. Can, can, we, can we come up with measures that help us using both networks to say something meaningful about about the, the space, about the, use of the user use of space. So we looked at one metric which is uh, very famous in the social network community, which is brokerage. A broker is, as the word already says, is someone that uh, brokers that 
connects different groups. So I have a bunch of friends that don't know these other bunch of friends of mine. So whenever this bunch of friends want to talk, want to say something to the other friends, they talk to me. So I have quite a bit of leverage and power on what I transmit to the other group. So let's say I, I, I'm, uh, I'm in Cambridge, but I also come down to the ATI. So I connect all the people to the ATI with the people in Cambridge. Let's say the old brokerage, right? A and all the economic values of brokerage and, and, and related. We try to use this, uh, this value in, in associating these two places and say, well, what's the broker val brokerage, I can't pronounce, brokerage value of a place? Is the, is the value of that place that that place has in connecting groups, different groups of people, so people that wouldn't be friends, perhaps. So connecting, if I go back, perhaps connecting, this, this has high brokerage in a way, let's say, let's assume, because it connects this guy with this guy and this guy, and maybe the, this student, I need to change the example, I want them not to exist here. So it's connecting different groups. This place is a connector for different groups. And we looked in our data, and use this metric to, um, th there's a reference to a paper you can look at in the next slide about this. We looked at what kind of categories of places had higher brokerage. And although there is a lot of noise, there's something very clear that you would expect. Residences actually have a bonding effect, so the opposite of brokerage. They, they kind of tend to cluster people that already know each other. Um, arts, museums, and travel obviously are on the other side. And if you go down to the subcategories, because this kind of data set also subcategories, you can see things like um, the bridging role of um, a, an apartment building and the bonding role of a mall. Kind of makes sense. Um, the, yeah, th that I, dumplings versus fried chicken. So there are things that don't to us make sense, but this is, this is the data talking to us. And, and, and some of these, I, I think, do make sense. But again, we were interested in looking at the policies and, and, and diversity and deprivation. Um, so here will take me, so this is the paper I was referring to if you're interested in more of these details. So I, I've described the brokerage concept. And um, this is the IMD index of multiple deprivation ranking in 2010. So uh, places were very deprived if they are, um, if I have, uh, a higher ranking. Um, so Hackney was up there, but if you look at the brokerage value through the data set of Hackney, it was very high. And what happened, if you, if you then um, try to look at how Hackney changed, and we've seen Hackney also in, 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 the, in the previous slide on how in effect is, is uh, index of multiple deprivation changed, it looks like it went um, from being the second most deprived, the, the, the second most deprived to the eleventh most deprived in the next version of the IMD. So in a way, we were trying to see it by looking at this brokerage value, which is a value that tells us how how many people is this place is connecting. Is it, is it a good place to connect people? In a way, it's very difficult to explain. It, it's, it's much more complex than that. But can that value somehow tell us something about how things? How, how, this, um, how this data is changing. I know that the brokerage um, <coughs> was done on quite a, quite a static data set. So um, uh, for this particular study, we didn't use the three years. But uh, I'm interested in now going back and trying to see if in the three years we see even more of this effect as, as soon as we go closer to the IMD of 2015-16. I know that, that in, in, in theory, in a, in a very... Um, far-fetched world, um, we could imagine of abolishing this IMD data collection and using proxies, data proxies for that. And, and that's what we're after, looking for proxies that um, already tell us how things are changing. And, and they, they, they don't give us a static view of, of, of the city, but they, they give us uh, an idea of how things are in fact moving and in which direction so that we perhaps can correct them a bit earlier rather than every five years, if we could. How am I doing? Okay. So, um, any questions on this part? So this is uh, this is a more so. So until now, um, I've talked mainly about how data 
can be used to help people to, um, to decide about the city. So it's mainly for urbanists, urban planners, um, high decision level groups, or perhaps a shop owner, which is a, something more personal, but it really um, is about the old city and the use of the city. Um, so it's more of a structure and, and quite also quite um, slow movement. Um, so the, the pace of the analysis doesn't need to be minutes. Now, um, if we're talking about what a user would find useful in their pockets, it, it, this is often something that um, is more related to the in-the-moment information, giving more information about how the city is moving to the person right here, right now. And, and one of the examples of this is an application we put out, which is called Open Street Cub, and um, it kind of was trying to fill a hole of how people find the best service, best taxi service. Now that there, there are a number of satellite services going around and we have Uber that um, kind of gives price surges depending on um, lots of dynamic variables. Can we compensate that and um, by using the analysis of the data, give information to the user of which is the best taxi service to um, to use at this point in time. First question is, is this useful at all? So we looked at data for um, London tax, uh, sorry, in this particular case, New York yellow cabs and Uber in New York. So it's the first part of the study. Um, the first slide should immediately tell you that a service is actually quite useful. And this is because uh, we plot taxi prices or yellow cabs with Uber prices and um, if every point was on this dash red line, I don't know if you see, that would mean that the prices are the same for every kind of a journey. But they're not. N most importantly, they're almost there. It looks like Uber is more expensive a little bit, but you, you need to do the error bars. So there is a lot of variability on, on that. And that means that when I go out and I know where I'm trying to go, I know I'm perhaps how many kilometers I'm trying to go, I don't know what is the best service out there for me, which means we need more information to know that. Again, we, we also plot the distribution. As you can see, a certain value, there's, there's a lot um, of need for that. Paper reference there to look at that later. Now, we were, <laughs> this is the, just to keep you awake, a story. We put out the app, and Tim O'Reilly retweeted us, and, and we had quite a bit of coverage. And this is a result of what happens if you have coverage in your app. Uh, we had two spikes <laughs> in, in downloads of the app. One was uh, when he covered it on Twitter, and the other one was when John Norton wrote in The Guardian about it. Um, we um, launched the service in New York and London to see differences. It looks like yellow cabs uh, were quite competitive in New York with Uber with some variability. This is just the price. It's a price per kilometer. But it also looked like black cabs, if you look at just the data in London, were much less competitive than, than that. So when we launched the service in London, we had this. Um, so black cabs and trip distance, the black line was always on top. Right? So, so you go out there. If I stop here, you go out there and say, I'm, I'm not taking a cab anymore. I'm going to call Uber. I, I'm not taking a black cab. Right? We wanted to go deeper, and uh, the reason I, I think this study is, is leading something interesting um, more generally is because if you just stop and the scratch the surface of the data, you see this, and you make a big mistake. <laughs> we had lots of cab drivers contacting us um, and saying things like, hey, you know, your estimates are wrong. It's not true. What you're saying is not true. So. Um, Oh, this is not showing. This is bad. Um, OK, I, I think there's a graph not showing that um, I, I need to find a way to project, if possible, um, <coughs> if we find a way. So I, I, I'll show you what I, I'll tell you in words, and then uh, you'll find the version that works. We tried 30 trips in three days. So I had um, two very valuable cliques that went around in London trying black cabs and um, Uber taxis 
uh, for the same origin and destination. So there were, of course, different routes, um, and we monitored the routes, and we have price differences and time differences. And what we saw was a picture of price difference that has um, the black cabs all around this area and everything else, the Uber kind of around this area. So what that meant for us, and there is an analysis where we're, we're writing a paper on it at the moment, is that although, yes, if you just look at this, black cabs look like they're more expensive, but you need to consider the fact that the routes that black cabs might be able to take are more uh, informed. They, they study a lot. You know, they, they have to take an exam to be a, yellow, uh, a, a black cab driver. So they know the back route. So when it's congested, when it's a short route, and the city needs to be known, um, that knowledge makes a difference. And it, it would it certainly make a difference in the time and sometimes also in the price, but mainly in the time. So if you want to go fast somewhere, um, you know, it, it looked like there was more. And, and also, um, Uber drivers um, tend to follow um, Google Maps or a navigation system for that. And so I think there is, there is a push for us to look into better navigation systems that consider other knowledge uh, to provide better navigation um, solutions. Um, so um, I, I think there um, is an area we haven't looked at, but uh, I think, I think we, we, saw, we saw this in the data. There is a, there's a lot to, uh, that can be done there. Let me see how I'm doing with time. I'll give you a couple of slides on, um, on one word. Uh, questions here? I'm sorry I can't project this one. Um, I'll, I'll make sure the slides are um, there. Um, any questions on this part? So uh, we've also done a more general study on how the data, what the data tells us about human mobility. Um, generally, um, and, and, and this is again a paper, generally there have been uh, quite a bit of um, studies that's considered models of mobility that use distance as a, as a mechanism to decide how far people go. So it, you tend to have a distribution of your movements that um, is based on distance, is distance and perhaps attractivity of a place a good, a good predictor, a good predictor of how far generally people go in a city. That, that, that was uh, when we started this um, general piece of work, um, that was what we had. Uh, there was, however, some research um, done by this um, chap here called Stauffer that um, it, it's called the, the theory of intervening opportunities. So it's, it seems like for him, um, and he tried on data of, um, I think it was migration um, data of people um, across the years. So it was kind of a, a, a very coarse-grained data set. Um, migration data from Cleveland. Is it true in urban data? So um, his theory was that if you have to um, go to a supermarket, it doesn't matter how far the supermarket is. It all, um, all it matters is how many other supermarkets there are before that one because you would try to stop at the earliest opportunity, in a way. So if you're if you here, how likely is it for you to move here? Well, it doesn't depend really just about the radius. It depends on how dense the area is. Is it true for our cities? And all of a sudden, we had somehow data to, to look at that. This is 34 cities, and um, this is density, and this is area size. And uh, while here you have... Um, a bit less order, when you look at the density, it looks like they, they kind of tend to, all the cities tend to align on a nice uh, mean transition line. Just to um, look more at the model of this and how we can possibly use it to model the mobility inside an urban environment, um, we define something called rank. Rank for a place, um, let's say a position of a user U, is the value of how many places there are in this radius. So in this particular case, the rank of U to E is four. There are four other places around that. 
Now, I note here that this is a general model work, so we didn't consider the categories of places. Of course, if you need a supermarket and there are no supermarkets around, perhaps that value changes. But general, this, this generally, this kind of property seems to be universal in all of our cities, as you can see from here. So we plotted all the transitions, uh, average transition um, for, um, for all, this is like three cities, this is all the cities, and they kind of um, have a sort of rank definition that collapses on a very nice single line, <laughs> which was very good, that we could then use in a model. Sorry, I'm going a bit fast here, but uh, just to give you the, the, the idea more than anything else. So the probability of a user in U moving to a location V is exactly our definition of the rank the, the, that we had before. It's one over the rank value, and we use a coefficient that is um, essentially um, derived from this model here. So if you do one over the rank value, uh, this is your probability. How likely is it that I go there? Well, it's proportional, inversely proportional to how many other things I have closer to me. This is um, essentially natural words, what, what I'm writing here. I don't tend to like formulas, but um, that's the idea. So um, simulation results, we built a sort of simulation model that used this probability to move agents around from all the various places we had in the city and prove that it was very similar to um, the, r so this is the rank model, and this is the points of the distribution, plotted distribution of distances of all the, um, the transitions that we had in the city. And it looked like um, there was a lot of overlap. And so, so the model somehow, at least at this level of um, granularity, was able to um, incorporate the general concepts of mobility that we have in a city, in various cities, in fact, in all the cities. Okay, great. Um, any questions? So the last thing I want to do is thank the people that have worked with me. And um, these are uh, current and ex-PhD students um, and also the co-authors of this work. Um, and you can find all the papers linked, uh, not linked, but referenced from the PowerPoint, from, from the slides version that you have there. If you want to see more details, most importantly, if you want to see references of other works that we think are relevant in that sort of area. And here are my details if you want to talk to me. Thank you. <laughs>